Welcome, folks. Um, my name is Ida V. Eskamani. I'm so excited to moderate this incredible panel today. Um, this is, you know, your happy hour. We're talking tax policy. There's nothing else I'd rather do on a Friday night than be with y'all right now to talk about how we can transform this state. Welcome to the Poverty Solution Summit, Restructuring Florida's Tax System. Um, and I've got some really great panelists with me today. I first want to Introduce myself. My name is Ida V. Eskamani. Uh, I'm the twin sister to Representative Anna Eskamani, which some of you may know. Um, I am an advocate uh, in the state legislature. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I represent Florida for All, a statewide coalition that includes uh, community organizations such as Florida Rising, Florida Immigrant Coalition, SEIU, um, Jobs of Justice, and, and we fight um, uh, for everyday people, our members. And my job is up in the state capitol. Uh, I bring people to this process and we fight for community wealth issues, for criminal justice reform. Uh, we fight to expand democracy and tax policy is a really integral part uh, of that effort as well. Uh, and, you know, we are here in a, in, a, in a state where we've got a budget crisis. We've got a state that has worked for, uh, for the elite few for a long, long time. And we want to start centering everyday people in the work that we do um, in the capital uh, and as well as in our local communities. And tax policy is super critical to that. And I'm so excited to have some incredible advocates and champions with me on this issue um, to, to talk through how we can restructure our tax system here in Florida. Um, and I first want to introduce uh, one of my favorite people uh, that I've met throughout this work, and that is Jose Javier Rodriguez. Um, I, for the first time ever, read this man's bio for this panel, and I was incredibly impressed uh, and felt very much like an underachiever. Um, and so I'm super excited just to provide a little bit of background about um, the Senator Jose Javier Rodriguez is a Harvard-trained attorney, practicing litigator. He's got diverse uh, litigation practice representing employees on individual, collective, and class, actions, uh, class action lawsuits. Um, he began his legal career as a legal aid lawyer, which has a very special place in all of our hearts, of course, um, representing low-wage workers, tenants, homeowner associations, small businesses, and neighborhood-based organizations. He served for eight years in the Florida legislature uh, after being elected in 2012, uh, and we miss him so much right now in this process. I can tell you that as someone on the ground in the Capitol right now. Um, he's received countless awards and recognitions for his work. Um, while in the House, he served as ranking member of the Finance and Tax Committee uh, in the Senate, served as vice chair of the Judiciary Committee. He has served as a law professor. He's a member of the adjunct faculty for Florida Constitutional Law at St. Thomas University School of Law. Um, he has taught on immigration law. Uh, he was a Peace Corps volunteer, uh, and he's got two uh, beautiful sons and a gorgeous wife uh, living in the city of Miami, and we're so grateful for all of his incredible work. Uh, and I can tell you as uh, someone who's worked in Florida politics for a long time, uh, Rod, uh, JGR has been one of the lone voices on tax reform in the legislature. The folks that are, are on this issue now certainly stand on his shoulders and we're very proud for his service there. Um, so welcome, Jose Javier Rodriguez, we're Thank happy you. to have you. Um, and I also would like to introduce uh, Esteban, who's with us from the Florida Policy Institute. Uh, prior to his employment, at FPI, Dr. Esteban Leonel Santos received his PhD in public affairs and a master's of public administration from the College of Community Innovation and Education uh, at the University of Central Florida. Go Knights. Uh, broadly, his areas of expertise include community-based participatory research, fiscal management, public administration, and public sector of ethics. While completing his PhD, Esteban served as an instructor of public fiscal management for UCF School of Public Administration. To date, Dr. Santos's research has focused on advancing social equity in administrative practices and has appeared in peer-reviewed academic journals. Uh, he has also served as an AmeriCorps public ally. So we've got a lot of public service up here in this panel um, to promote the earned income tax credit and the volunteer income tax assistance programs across communities susceptible to predatory lenders. And on a personal note, uh, Esteban and I actually went to high school together. And so <laughs> this is, this is uh, just a dream panel for me, two of my favorite people talking about a policy that uh, is inherently complicated and designed so that folks like us don't understand it. And that's why it's so important that we do and that we unpack it and that we make a tax system that works for everyday people and not just the big businesses and corporations in this state. Um, 
So welcome, Dr. Sanchez. It's wonderful to have you as well. Yes, and now that we have introductions out of the way, uh, I want to thank y'all again for joining us this Friday afternoon. Um, we are going to hear from our panelists for about 15 minutes. Uh, oh, excuse me. We have 15 minutes reserved for Q&A. So we have a bit more for hearing from our panelists. We have some pre-written questions. We do want to have your um, Q&A as well. And so if you already know your questions, please pop them in the chat. If you have them throughout, pop them in the chat. We are monitoring that. And we definitely want to uh, make sure we get those questions in as well. Um, but with that, we will dive right in. Y'all have already heard enough from me, I'm sure. So, um, so I want to start with you, Senator Rodriguez. Um, as I noted, during your time in the Florida legislature, you made multiple attempts to reform our tax system, to address the inequities of our regressive system. Um, can you share some of those proposals with us that you championed and how they would have benefited Florida residents? So firstly, th thank you to you, uh, uh, to Dr. Santis and to Catalyst for putting this together and, and having me on. Um, you know, so, so I, 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 I'm glad that I get to go first because I'm, um, I am not uh, an expert on tax policy itself, uh, like, like Dr. Santis. Um, you know, I, I, my experience mainly comes from what you just said, uh, fighting the battle oftentimes uh, too lonely of a battle in Tallahassee on trying to make our tax system more progressive uh, rather than regressive. And so I think if, if we're going to have a theme here in terms of things for folks to remember, I think one thing we can agree on is that tax policy in Tallahassee is really important and it deserves us putting it um, you know, as one of the top issues we should be advocating on. It's really difficult uh, mostly because, like you said, a lot of these issues are very complicated. They're tough to get at, um, you know, and, and oftentimes they're just not the things that really excite folks. And I think that we need to collectively, you know, I've traveled that journey in terms of really understanding how important these issues really are long term. So I think that's kind of one of the, the main takeaways. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think, you know, Again, I'll let uh, Dr. Santis kind of talk more about this stuff, but the fact that Florida is the second most regressive state, depending on how you count in our tax system, is the problem, right? So that means very uh, basically that as a percentage of your income, the lower you are on the income scale, you bear a heavier burden, right? So a simple way of explaining this is, you know, we have no personal income tax here in Florida, right? And, you know, income tax can be progressive or regressive depending on how you design it. But what we rely on very heavily at the state level are sales taxes, which are always regressive, right? Because, you know, if you are out there earning money um, and you're low income, you know, it's not like you're putting a lot of that into the, you know, some, you know, trust in the Cayman Islands, you're spending that money. And so you are paying a lot in taxes. Uh, versus somebody uh, or some entity, a business uh, that is avoiding taxes, et cetera, where you can't avoid that because you have to go and buy food. You have to, you know, do all the things that you have to do. Um, so, the, and, and the other thing that we confront is that Tallahassee is not a friendly place, right? We have a super, we have, uh, con, with the exception of one constitutional officer, um, in, in our in our cabinet at the statewide level, uh, we have Republican control of our of the three branches. Uh, I'm sorry, two branches of government, um, and you know, legislature and and the and the governor's mansion, and um, the particular brand of leadership in there right now is very hostile to what you know of, of, to making our our system uh, more progressive. That has not always been the case. Um, if we go back and look at Governor Bob Martinez, uh, all, we have to go pretty far back, but uh, Governor Bob Martinez actually tried to reform one of the most significant parts of this tax system, um, and he met with a lot of opposition. So he was willing to go there in terms of opening up the conversation on this stuff. Um, you know, I, very controversial in terms of some of the stuff that he proposed, but nevertheless, and we also had uh, Republicans in prior legislatures that were willing to propose and even vote for some of the things that I'm going to talk about, and, and I'm going to be try to I'm going to try to be brief 
because again, I, I don't know that, that I don't know that we, I'm, you know, I've I've had to learn this stuff enough so that I could I could um, summarize it. Because again, I'm in the legislative environment where if I can't explain it in five minutes, uh, I lose people. Um, and <laughs> and I know and I know that everybody who's listening here is is uh, has a, has a higher attention span and IQ than the people that I dealt with in in, uh, in the finance and tax committee, uh, with the exception of the people that are nice and friends. But um, so there are a couple proposals that I'm going to discuss, which I think which I think are probably the most important and ones that I advocated for. Uh, the most important is what is referred to as either com combined reporting water's edge or unitary uh, reporting. And what the reason why this is important is because it's frankly a tax loophole in our corporate tax that most states either never had or have uh, gone ahead and fixed. And Florida is an outlier because it never fixed it. Um, and it's one of the most important ways for us to close loopholes. Here, we're not talking about raising taxes. We're talking about uh, correcting an inequality in terms of how um, how our tax system looks at who's a, who's a taxpayer in, in our corporate tax system. So um, it, it, if this reform, the combined reporting re reform were put in place, it would require corporations, uh, basically it would require us as a state of Florida look at a look at a business globally to assess how much money they made um, relative to how much business they do in Florida, right? Seems pretty simple. Everybody probably thinks that's how it works, but in reality, it doesn't because if a corporation operates outside in Florida, but also somewhere else, either in another state or in another country, they can play all kinds of accounting games and make themselves look more poor in Florida uh, than the reality. And that's in fact what happens. And so I'll give you one example, which is, Let's say you have a, a company, uh, let's call it, uh, you know, Escamani Holdings that's based um, in another state and they have a subsidiary here in Florida, right? And so the Florida subsidiary rents trademarks and all kinds of stuff from the mother corporation, right? Um, and so even though they're doing a lot of business here and making a lot of profit, they make themselves look poor because on their books, they're spending all this money to rent trademarks. Well, they're renting trademarks from themselves, uh, but it makes them look more poor here and therefore they pay less taxes. States that have fixed that loophole don't fall, you know, don't fall for that trick because it doesn't work. And so the, the, the effort to try to fix this, uh, my, I, care, I took the torch from uh, Senator Dan Gelbers, now mayor of Miami Beach, he served immediately before I my time in the legislature, uh, and he kind of passed the torch to me. And, and during my time in the legislature, I actually did have a number of opportunities, especially in the House, to raise this issue. Uh, the chair of the Finance and Tax Committee, um, I know many will cringe, was Matt Gates at the time. And as the ranking member on the Finance and Tax Committee when I was in the House, we sparred on a lot of issues. Uh, but what I will say is that he did allow for a counterpoint and sometimes a very aggressive counterpoint. Well, not sometimes, all times, a pretty aggressive counterpoint um, on a lot of um, uh, tax. And this was an issue that we um, that that he allowed us to have a workshop on. So I kind of presented a whole thing on this. And the interesting thing is for every year in the history, as far as you can go back, there is an estimate that our revenue estimating conference does and says, if we fix this, how much more money would the state of Florida co collect? And again, this is all money that's been offshored or pushed into another state, right? Businesses that operate entirely in Florida cannot play this trick, right? So the, if, if we're raising more taxes, uh, or I'm sorry, there's not raising taxes. If, if, if more tax revenue comes in because we close this loophole, it's 100% money that's coming from out of state, right? So it, it, it's a no brainer, right? And the, the, the year that I made such a fuss about this, 2015, was the last year the Revenue Estimating Conference actually put a number to, to this, right? Um, and so it's very obvious that they, that since then they said, you know what? Uh, we're just gonna start saying, quote unquote, indeterminate. Well, I, I don't buy it, right? <laughs> 
basically at that point, legislative leaders said, hey, you guys better just stop giving an estimate because the estimate at that time was just under $500 million. Uh, by now, it's more than that, right? So a half a billion dollars um, that that's basically sheltered with tax avoidance structures in other states is available. And the bill that I always filed every year to try to correct this, I've passed the torch to Rep Escamani and others in, in the House. Um, the bill I always filed said, hey, we take 100% of that money that we recapture and we put it into the public school system, right? How can you say no to that, right? Uh, but of course, so far Republicans have said no, but in the past they did not. Uh, the past, uh, uh, in the past, uh, the, the last economic crisis, they actually started the process in the Senate of passing the bill. Um, and so ironically, there's more Republicans who've actually voted for this proposal than against it, even though they try to keep it off the agenda now. Um, I'm going to hit on a couple other topics, but during this time, uh, and shout out to Karen, uh, Karen Woodall, right, um, and all the organizations she started and people she's mentored. Uh, but we were working really hard. How can we insert into the conversation ways to look at our existing system and, and try to insert more, uh, more ways to make it regress, uh, progressive? We tried to figure out ways with property taxes to try to figure out if there's a way for renters to get a benefit uh, from property tax reductions. Couldn't quite figure it out, but I almost got something on the agenda to, to workshop. But one idea that we did have back then that finally caught traction later on when I was in the Senate was to piggyback off of the federal earned income tax credit. Um, and we actually had a workshop on it when, when I served in the Senate. But the idea started way back when I was in the House, and it was one of the ideas that we threw out there. Um, and it was one of the ideas we just tried to keep alive, but we never got a workshop on it. But the idea is, you know, the federal in earned income tax credit is all based on making sure that low-income working people can have a tax break as well. So for those uh, making, um, and, and, and Dr. Uh, uh, Santis will help me, but low-income and moderate-income working families can get a tax reduction and it basically works as a rebate uh, on their taxes, um, you know, if they basically show that they've worked uh, and earned and learned, earned low wages. It's pretty amazing, has bipartisan support. I mean, everybody, for, you know, from Reagan on down, no one's against it. And so the idea we had is, well, listen, um, here in Florida, the regressive tax that people pay is largely sales tax and a number of other things. If you lived in Florida an entire year, you've paid that tax. So why don't we just say, Whatever you get in the earned income tax credit from the federal level, we'll just say we'll, we'll add on 10 percent, just cut you a check from the state of Florida and say thank you for all that you do for the state of Florida. Here's your you know, tax rebate. And uh, that would be huge. Uh, and, and, and I think the, the estimate is hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, I think five the, the, the bill that Javier Fernandez and I finally ended up filing out of that workshop that I got um, uh, and shout out to you guys because a lot of people who are listening or participating here actually helped us to put that together and make it make it a success. Would have resulted in five hundred million dollars uh, being returned to basically uh, low wage Florida taxpayers, and we got a hearing on it. Um, and nobody's really against it. It's just a question of are working people going to be a priority? We call it the working person's tax rebate. Um, so if you add both of these two things together, it's a billion dollars, right? Um, and one of them is directly going into the hands of people that need it the most and have been paying taxes and working all year. Um, the last thing, and I have to mention this, um, you know, this is the third thing, um, is this horrendous tax giveaway. And I, I think a lot of us are probably aware of this, uh, but in recent years, um, you know, the, the legislature just gratuitously decided to piggyback uh, on what, what you know, the, the federal tax cuts at the... Um, you know, that they were for the rich at the federal level um, and just basically do a similar thing. And, and uh, we tried to stop, uh, we being, you know, myself and a group of, uh, of, of colleagues, um, you know, Rep. Smith, Rep. Fernandez, Rep. Escamani, some familiar names you may know here, um, uh, and a number of others um, uh, in the House and Senate. We got together and we, we asked, you know, we asked DeSantis, hey, listen, we're in a pandemic use your executive authority to prevent a tax rebate of $543 million to the absolute wealthiest Florida taxpayers, right? 
And when I say Florida tax, corporate taxpayers, we're talking about the top 1% of those business entities that do business in Florida, overwhelmingly not headquartered in Florida, right? They're not Florida businesses, right? They're businesses, multinationals, big businesses. The, the, the businesses that end up paying the Florida, Florida cor corporate income tax are very small sliver of the top 1%. And so in the middle of this pandemic, right, where we're trying to get unemployment insurance out the door, we're trying to sh uh, shore up our, our health systems, our school districts, et cetera, and we're looking at budget shortfalls that are going to impact communities all over the state, Governor DeSantis is literally signing checks that send $543 million overwhelmingly outside the state. And they went ahead and did it, right? And this was something the legislature put in place. DeSantis didn't stop. And it was completely gratuitous giveaway. Um, there's really no justification for it. Um, it. There was this complicated legislative formula and sort of complicated justifications. But basically, at the end of the day, it was just a straight up giveaway. Um, and one of the mantras here is our tax system is so unfair, right? And so, again, had that money not been re basically redistributed to all, you know, because every time they do that, they're redistributing the burden onto everybody else, right? Every corporation in Florida that can't take advantage of these tax loopholes, every corporation in Florida that actually is, uh, I say corporation, but what I mean is business, every Florida business that can't take advantage of these loopholes, every Florida business uh, that's playing by the rules and not, you know, paying, you know, lawyers and accountants all this money to play these tricks. And all of us, because we all pay Florida taxes, right? Oh, we don't have, Florida, you know, uh, tax avoidance schemes. Uh, maybe some of you do. I don't know what they are, but um, that's not nice. So stop it. But, but the point is that um, had they not done that, right, had they not sent this gratuitous giveaway, that maybe wouldn't it would have enabled the legislature in the state of Florida to make everything more fair, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that that money needs to be immediately spent, right? It may just mean that when you're designing the budget, the sources of that money um, is actually more fair. And in Florida, it almost can't be more unfair. So we got a lot of work to do. This is a high priority um, and it should be a high priority. Uh, but I hope that I've helped to explain um, at least two or three of the top issues in my view and top opportunities. You absolutely have, JJR, and we're so grateful. And I have to ask, when you were uh, assigned to the Finance and Tax Committee, was that a goal of yours or was that just a committee you had and you decided just to, to embrace it? Well, it, it was a goal of mine. Um, and uh, I, I did it. I did end up end up deciding to embrace it. Um, you know, this is not a slight on any of our colleagues, but it's really hard, really hard, uh, to fight these battles in the legislature. It just does, these tax issues don't draw that much attention. And one of the other kind of structural issues is, you know, the you know other than um, you know Policy Institute and Karen Woodall and and, and organized labor and other allies, um, you know. Almost every lobbyist at the Capitol has a client that they care that cares about this and doesn't want you to touch this, right? right? And so if you look out at the audience in any of these committee hearings, literally almost every face is like, don't do this, this is not good, right? And a handful of of of, of people that are representing everyday people, right, that don't have lobbyists, like the other side of this issue is literally everybody else other than that top one percent of uh you know of 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 uh you know businesses again in the entire world because you know for a large part the businesses 100 percent inside florida aren't losers here they're actually winners so right. as the florida-based business would be a winner in in a lot of these including the the rebate right because if more people in our communities have more disposable income you know that that's a good thing for all of us for our economy so that's, I think, one of the biggest issues. And, I, and again, it just comes back to the point where we just need to, as, as, as collective advocates, we just need to make sure that these issues are, are top, front and center because the forces aligned against us are almost everybody else who, who, uh, who has a lobbyist registration up in Tallahassee. 100%. And as, as, a, as a lobbyist for the people in the Capitol, that I can absolutely agree with that assessment. And uh, I want to toss it to Dr. Santos for this next question, although I think both of you would be pretty outraged by this as well. I mean, it's no secret to anybody that we are in a budget crunch. Um, well, perhaps it may be a secret to Governor Ron DeSantis because he's, he's rolled out a very optimistic budget, which 
um, I think has a lot of uh, numbers there that are questionable. And the legislature is looking at big cuts right now. They're looking at a $2 billion deficit um, for this coming budget year. Uh, and the Chamber of Commerce recently, the Florida Chamber of Commerce rolled out their legislative pr uh, uh, priorities just this week. And they actually included uh, continuing reductions in the corporate income tax, which uh, is currently set to 4.5, uh, about 4.5%, and it should be at 5.5%. And that links directly to that giveaway uh, JGR, you, you referenced, right? And so we're seeing the, the big business agenda come through, wanting to continue these reductions, continue these corporate giveaways, not talk about these big issues. And it's why I'm very excited for this conversation, because to your point, so many folks don't know what's going on around our state tax structure. Um, you assume folks are paying their fair share. You assume there's some accountability. You, you assume there's transparency. And there is not. We don't even know those uh, corporations, or excuse me, those businesses that got that corporate giveaway because our state law prohibits us from knowing. There's a lot of um, confidentiality statutes as well. So we don't even know who gets these dollars. We only know on the offhand um, chance that there's litigation at the federal level that you know folks who are much smarter than I can investigate and find out how much money these different businesses got, right? Um, so we are right now just wrapping up week three of legislative committee weeks. Um, session starts March 2nd. And we have with us uh, Dr. Santis, who has been digging deep into all of these pieces. Um, and so, Esteban, I have a, a question for you. Um, could you talk about, from FBI's perspective and from your work and the work you've been doing, um, what can we expect in the upcoming budget uh, that the legislature is working on um, and what is actually needed to recover in a post-pandemic economy? If you're talking, Dr. Santos, we yeah, hear you. Yeah. There you I, go. I saw it. I, uh, I just want to say thank you. I'm very just grateful to be here with uh, Senator. Oh, I'll go with Senator Rodriguez, uh, Legislator Rodriguez, and Ida. Um, in terms of the question, I, I can just briefly touch on the recommendation that Governor Ron DeSantis uh, published, and then I can kind of comment on what I think that will do in the legislature. And just to briefly summarize the budget process. Um, the governor has 30, basically 30 days before the start of session to release a recommendation. And then in theory, the legislatures will use that recommendation to create both a house budget and a Senate budget. And then they will negotiate over differences and that will become what we call the General Appropriations Act, which is the main budget. But um, it all starts with this recommendation. Um, and what we know, and I think Ida mentioned, there's been this rosy picture, although we know we're going to have a $2 billion deficit. Nevertheless, the recommendation speaks to an increasing budget, about $4.4 billion more than our budget right now. And there's been a lot of talk about it, um, as if the increase is a sign of recovery, but there's some assumptions that we have to unpack or just lay bare when we talk about this. And one is the role of the federal government in this. When we look at the increase on what's driving our budget up, a lot of it is due to federal funds. Um, in fact, if we were just to look at the increase alone, over 70% of the rise in our budget right now is from healthcare cost. So we have with 614 people out of work and thousands of them dealing with like the prolonged consequences of COVID-19, our Medicaid program is getting more and more expensive. Now, fortunately, the state received around $550 million or saved $550 million thanks to an, an expansion in the federal uh, government's share of our Medicaid program. Um, so I think just one thing, the unsung hero of the budget increase that has been laid out it has been the federal government. And we have to mention the CARES Act funds, which came at $5.9 billion. And this is all to say that as we move forward, um, at least we should acknowledge the role of the federal government because it stands against this austerity narrative that seems to be um, against any kind of federal help from the federal government. Instead, it calls for cuts. So I think just the fact that the federal government is helping our budget at least helps us fight that paradigm of austerity and start talking more about investment. Now, that's one portion of it. The other portion driving it, um, this optimism, which is unfounded, is sales taxes. And I know Senator Rodriguez mentions uh, sales taxes. Sales taxes are regressive, um, but really, when we look at it, our sales tax figures have been driven by one, in the beginning of the pandemic, people had an opportunity to save a little more. Later, when things started to open up again, they were able to spend those savings and draw that down. 
well, that's not sustainable. So unless we see any kind of federal assistance or any other assistance to people, the ability to draw down savings is not gonna be there. So that will not be driving sales tax collections. The other component is in Florida, our tourism industry is badly, badly hurt. If we look at economists, they're saying that it's gonna take two, two or three years to recover. So we've seen a decline in out-of-state visitors, both um, traveling, you know, driving here, visiting internally or out of star, let's say flying in from places like Brazil or um, Canada. So we're seeing a decline there. Our tourism industry is not recovering as fast and all of it is underpinned or based on having a vaccine distributed so that people feel a little more comfortable and safe traveling. So there's a lot of risk in the budget as it stands and the legislature is gonna to have to look at that. And I think that's where there's been a clash because the governor's budget is more optimistic and it doesn't seem to be taking this risk into account. Whereas the legislators are starting to talk about austerity, are starting to talk about budget cuts because they're taking that. But the one thing that's missing from the conversation and is what Senator Rodriguez has been fighting for is revenue because they're all fighting as if there's this limited amount of resources that we have because they're basing the budget on sales taxes. But we have opportunities to raise revenue and increase how much we have. And that should be the conversation right now. Um, I'll, I'll leave that, I'll leave that the budget conversation. I have much more, but I think <laughs> there's more questions. No, absolutely, uh, Dr. Sientes. That's an excellent point in the sense of we know we have a crisis here and the legislature is talking about these cuts and there are serious consequences um, to our communities that should not happen and don't need to happen. Um, and uh, JJR, I want to toss it to you. We've actually gotten some questions already in the chat too around this, this subject. Um, and it sort of bounces off uh, Dr. Sanchez, what, what you said as well. Um, but to, to you, JJR, so we know Florida relies very heavily on sales tax and we're in a position where we, uh, that makes our economy very fragile uh, to states, to crises, uh, and particularly an unprecedented pandemic. Um, so we know that we're more dominant in sales tax because of tourism and hospitality opportunities here. Um, why, so it seems very obvious that our economy is, is, uh, is too fragile and unsustainable in a sense. Um, why is it so hard to make these changes, uh, these like, common sense reforms that we see other states doing? And how can we as advocates uh, be better to try to pass these policies in the legislature? Yeah, so I, I think that it, in my view, you know, there are very savvy and very good advocates that have a lot of good information. I think the challenge has been creating that sort of critical mass of legislators that really want to drive the conversation in terms of tackling how regressive our tax system is. And so when I say the very good information that advocates have been able to put out there, including the uh, folks I'm on here with, there's a, a lot of disinformation. So one of the, you know, when we talk about progressive taxes, um, Dr. Santis will help me on this, but, I, you know, property taxes tend to be more progressive, right? Because the more valuable your property is, the more you pay. And even though we know rent, you know, the, the, the cost of property taxes get passed on to renters, strictly speaking, renters don't get a bill, right? It's only those owners of property. So a, as they go, property taxes are more progressive. The, the, the issue we have here is that particularly in South Florida and other areas where you have low income homeowners, moderate income homeowners that kind of frankly feel like they're tapped out. Part of the reason for that is that one of the things, one of the tricks that the, that the state of Florida continually does is at the state level, right? The legislature and the governor, they shift burdens onto local government, local institutions, right? And so every year, it, it's they, they divest just a little bit more out of public education funding, out of um, out of uh, public health funding, and they put just a little bit more burden on the local level, right? So you know, in the Miami Dade, for example, you know, every time there's a big need for infrastructure or something else in our public health system, uh, the Jackson system, our school system, right, our school board, um, the funding stream is always. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 an added local tax. 
And I think that's one of the things that's really important to know going into this fiscal crisis that is, is, is on the tail of the economic, public health, and other crisis, is that politicians in Tallahassee on the Republican side love, love to blame local governments, not support them, and then shift the responsibility onto them, right? I mean, we see it very easily with the way that DeSantis has handled this pandemic, but they do the same thing in the budget. And I think it's one of the few things that I feel like uh, that, that I think as legislators, uh, particularly in South Florida, um, at least for a time, every single year, we were able to call that question, right? Because every year, when it comes to our school funding, um, we would cry foul and say, listen, you're, you're shifting too much of this to the local level. And then they'd say, oh, we maintained school funding or we slightly increased uh, per pupil spending, when in fact those increases were largely coming from mandates that local governments raise tax revenue. Um, and so that's one of the biggest tricks uh, that they have in the book that I think we should get ready to call them on because I suspect that they're getting ready to do that kind of thing. I don't know what else I can say, but I mean, that, that's just in addition to what I said before. No, it's it's great. And there's a, a follow-up question. This uh, I'm curious what your insight is, JJR, from your experience. Uh, you know, the bill that's been refiled many sessions prior that got a, a hearing a couple of weeks ago is the, the online sales tax bill, as we call it. Um, sales tax for those third-party sellers. Um, curious, uh, this is not technically not a new tax. It's closing a consumer tax loophole, so to speak. Uh, but of course, this legislature is quick to close consumer tax loopholes and not touch those corporate tax loopholes. Uh, they've, uh, I think Dr. Sanders can give a, a more accurate number, but I saw some estimates around potentially $700 million in revenue on this piece uh, if they were to pass this. Uh, many states have this type of policy, but nonetheless, uh, we've seen with the pandemic that more folks have been shopping online, right? And so this is effectively a new tax for a lot of folks. Curious what your sense is, JJR, on if the legislature passes this, uh, you know, what's your assessment is if they do and, and, and uh, what do you, how do you think that'll impact the overall narrative and the budget and, and things of that nature if they manage to, to pass that bill? I don't know how it'll impact the overall narrative on the budget, but this is one that's been very interesting because it pits Florida businesses, brick and mortar businesses against out of state businesses, right? In a way that's easy for people to grasp because we're, you know, you know, we, we you know, when, when we're buying something online, um, you know, we're, we're very well aware when that tax gets added and, and when it doesn't. So everybody can really grasp it. It's not something legislature, legislature can get away from because it's been in the news and been litigated so much. Um, and interestingly, hasn't really been that partisan. And so um, I think it's something that can get done. And, um, you know, I don't know how it affects the narrative, but, you know, if the incentive was there to do it, um, you know, th this year, certainly it's there. And uh, Dr. Sanchez, you've got a question for you as well, and, and really about We've, we've all talked about just the current fiscal crisis. Um, what are some of the, the safety net or supplemental programs in Florida that you know, could be at risk with this you know, level, with these conversations around austerity? And if we don't find ways to fill this budget gaps, what are some of the consequences in your opinion we could experience uh, this legislative session? I, I, it's important to note when we talk about um, our funding levels is that even prior to the pandemic and prior to our fiscal difficulties at the moment, we did not do very well in a lot of our public services and a lot of our funding. I mean, if we were to look at our employment insurance system and just see how it collapsed, uh, it should be an indication of how we were doing uh, before. So that in itself is in peril. So uh, I think in unemployment insurance, if we're looking for an example of something that will, might struggle uh, through the pandemic, um, if we look at some of the actions up in Tallahassee, that's one. Um, but I do want to highlight that pandemic or not, we were struggling with a lot of social services. So, I mean, if we were poor, we ranked very poorly in public education, at least K through 12, um, in healthcare costs as well. And there's a case to be made here for expanded Medicaid. 
Uh, that's not that in terms of like the budget. That's a conversation we should be having, particularly when we look at how much federal money is helping offset our healthcare costs. The question should come up: If we're taking this money now, why can't we take it and expand Medicaid? Uh, that's a question we should be having. Um, I do think we have to be very wary of the austerity uh, narrative, and we should just be really pushing the investment. Um, I do want to add, because there's something interesting here, kind of backtracking. Uh, Senator Rodriguez did mention that, you know, usually the everyday Floridian probably is not evading or avoiding any taxes. The online sales tax is, I guess it is a consumer loophole, because when we do purchase out of out of state, so it's always out of states, um, online items, right? The, the way that the system is set up now is you have to look at that. You have to calculate. If you didn't pay a tax, you have to calculate how much you owe and you send it to the Department of Revenue. Well, the fact is people don't do that because of the compliance cost. You have to be aware that you have to do that. Then you have to calculate it on your own and you have to send it. Uh, so there is- You have to know where to send it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, we accidentally have avoided or evaded a tax. Uh, so it's not, not a really our fault is that the system is poorly designed. Um, by closing this consumer loophole, sure, we're, pinning, we're fixing a problem, but it can't be the end. Um, it can't, we can't just do that and just walk away from the conversation. This is one strategy among other ones, like uh, Sarah Rodriguez mentioned, like combined reporting, for example. Um, so with that, stop. No, I, I deeply appreciate that. That's uh, a personal beat that I have in the sense of, and to your point, Senator Rodriguez, you're absolutely correct, that uh, this is a, will it's a bipartisan piece and it does balance with brick and mortar and our small businesses, which are always at an unfair advantage and not, do not have the same loopholes and protections and, and legal teams as, you know, the big companies in Florida, like say Publix and Disney and Universal and Comcast and all these folks, right? Um, that often write the rules for themselves. Uh, but at the same time, it's very frustrating to see how quickly this legislature can mobilize around closing a consumer tax loophole while leaving yeah. these corporate tax loopholes wide open. And <laughs> if we're going to tax us, if you're going to, you know, close loopholes that everyday people have been, you know, in, in, accidentally evading, why are we not addressing these loopholes that corporations have been intentionally invading? In, in fact, they've written the rules to allow them to do yeah. that, right? Yeah, and, and that's the thing, is that the, the people paying the tax, and, and I think sometimes when, when you hear a superficial description of this, it, it's missed. Obviously, you didn't, you, you all didn't miss it in your explanation, uh, and, and, and maybe I did, but the, the one paying the tax is the one purchasing, right? The, the, the only thing the company does is collect and remit it, right? Um, and so, it, it, you know, when, when it's discussed in committee, it's a question of collecting the tax and not changing who owes it. Um, and unlike the two of you, though, I'm not going to accuse everybody watching of being a tax dodger. I'm just, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> we are all tax dodgers, didn't even know. <laughs> For the record, I love paying taxes. I think paying your taxes is patriotic. Like, I look forward to paying more. But, <laughs> but I want everyone to pay their fair share, right? Um, and Dr. Sanchez, you brought up, a, you know, you brought up a good point around Medicaid expansion. We had a question about that too, actually. And I do want to start shifting to more of the audience questions. We're getting quite a few in. Um, so I want to fit as many as we can. Um, and actually, I think this question might be for both of you, but it's sort of a Miami-based question. So I'm going to hand it to you first, um, uh, JJR. But, uh, and, and I'm not even, I'm in Orlando, y'all, currently in Tallahassee. So I might not, I don't know this, this you know, this Miami tea here, but um, around Medicaid expansion. So earlier today, earlier today, we heard from the Florida Health Justice Project on how Medicaid expansion might offer one way to raise revenue given the enhanced federal match. Curious if the panelists have any thoughts on how all the recent New York and San Francisco tech and business transplants to Miami mm. uh, might impact progress on these policy proposals. JJ, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, my, my reaction, so first of all, um, you know, uh, great that uh, Dr. Santis mentioned uh, Medicaid expansion. Uh, I believe it's still like four or five billion dollars that we would get every year. Um, you know, and obviously we missed out many years, uh, but that we would get, and that's our tax dollars. We already paid taxes. I enjoy living uh, in, um, places where tax systems are more fair. Uh, I, I don't enjoy paying taxes, but I do enjoy them being fair. And I'm happy to pay them uh, knowing that they go to good things, uh, but I don't enjoy, I don't enjoy it. Um, 
but but I think the the big the the issue of you know the reason why uh, so much uh, of the um, sort of tech and you know industry was able to grow and maintain talent in um, you know in other places is there, there's a lot of reasons, right? And I think in South Florida, we fit a lot of those, but not all of them, right? And so I think that when we're looking at, I mean, the other thing is that Miami-Dade generally at the state, uh, not the state, excuse me, well, the state level as well, but the county and city level tends not to be a great negotiator, right? It tends to be, you know, give away city, both in terms of land as well as other things um, when you know, folks want to come and, and do and you know bring business to us, right? We don't really have a history of negotiating very well to make sure that you know that comes with the infrastructure and investment in schools, et cetera, that we need to be able to sustain that, right? Um, and so I think that's one concern. And I think my main concern is not really fiscal, it's more on the affordable housing front. Uh, because, um, you know, a lot of the questions that people are raising are sort of saying, uh, wait a minute, uh, how far along are we in terms of tackling climate change and, and understanding what that's going to do to um, how we live? Um, and now we're going to be injecting a lot of potential capital, uh, potentially inviting a lot of like very well healed individuals to come and relocate in Miami. Very welcome. We actually we very much welcome diversifying our economic base, because as you mentioned, you know, depending so heavily on trade, you know, uh, tourism and construction, um, those things go up and down, right? And sort of diversify our economy, have higher paying jobs. How do we accomplish that? We don't accomplish that by what's been done in the past, which is, oh, you want to, you know, you're, you're a, you know, a flashy celebrity who has a company um, and, you know, everybody's going to roll out the red carpet and give, you know, and do all these giveaways um you know for somebody to move here right and that's not that's not really the model that's not how other cities have built wealth and had st you know stable communities and with good jobs we absolutely have that opportunity and there's a lot of great people who've been working toward that and this is finally a moment where it's sort of popping to the surface where it might actually be real and i want to highlight that um, and I think we here in Miami are having that conversation about how do we not mess this up for the long term, right? Um, so I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not dissing it at all. I'm just highlighting the fact that we've been down this road before. Uh, let's learn from the past. And it directly relates to finance and tax. So it's Absolutely. a very appropriate question. Awesome. Uh, Even though I totally didn't answer it because that had to do with healthcare. So. <laughs> no, you're great. You are fine. And you know, you you both have reminded, I think, to, to the listeners how important it is to get money into people's hands. How that is one of the best economic stimulus that we have. And part of the the regressive structure here is that it's taking money away from everyday people and not putting money back into their hands to put back into the economy. And even when we think about you know bringing in tech jobs, things like that, how do we make sure that the most vulnerable Floridians, our essential workers, are not left out of this conversation, right? Um, I do have a question for Dr. Sanchez from the audience. Um, are there any safety net or supplemental programs in place for Florida families that will lose the earned income tax credit this tax season due to the mass amounts of unemployed compensation reported? I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat the question? I, I can. I'm sorry, and I'm, I don't know if my internet is be. Um, this is around the Safety, are there any safety nets or supplemental programs in place for Florida families that will lose the earned income tax credit this tax season due to the mass amounts of unemployment compensation reported? So I believe uh, Congress just passed a uh, look, uh, I think, look back provision. So individuals who did lose their job will be able to use their previous tax return for their EITC calculations. Um, hopefully they'll continue to do that uh, because of that issue. So they, they have, uh, they've looked at that, yes. Brilliant. Look at that. It's like we've got MSNBC on here. This is great. Um, I got a question for you, JJR, uh, kind of related to the Miami piece you just mentioned. Um, is the sales tax revenue that goes to the state of Florida available by county? Uh, curious how much is generated by Miami-Dade in comparison to other counties and how that relates to the level of local burden. Right. So, uh, so I, I think a lot of people know this, that uh, there is a local sales tax um, in addition to a state sales tax. So 
Uh, Miami Dade collects the maximum. I don't know the breakdown, right? But um, you know, if you if you talk to any South Florida legislators or you know any local governments, everyone will tell you that we are donors, right? We are we we uh, relative to what our public institutions receive in state tax dollars um, versus what comes out of this area, we are donors. And I think something that I'm, I think I'm getting a nod from the the, the expert who would know. <laughs> Dr. Santos, so, you have so any? So you're well, you're welcome, everybody else. You're welcome. Well, I think you taught me this actually, JJR. Just the frustration around how in the legislature, the the state lawmakers often, you know, uh, pre preempt local governments, right? Overrule local laws, um, often do a lot to sort of place the blame on local governments for different issues when. Uh, really, our local governments and our cities are the ones that are producing this revenue, right? I mean, this is where the tourism industry thrives, and this is where these dollars are coming from. And uh, and so often, those dollars, you know, go back to the state and then given away to these corporations who just create more low-wage jobs, jobs that don't provide health insurance, and they continue not to pay their fair share in the state. And that whole argument around we want to create no, more jobs. You know, before this pandemic, we had an unemployment rate of 2.9%. Uh, we know that's not fully inclusive, right, to a lot of folks, but that was our unemployment rate. And even then, folks were living paycheck to paycheck. And I, right, and in South Florida, and now we're at a statewide unemployment around 6%. In some counties, it's it's, it's higher. In Osceola County, it's 8.7%, for example. That's Disney's backyard, basically. Um, and, you know, we are now, you know, facing this big budget uh, deficit and again, no real, uh, we're not seeing momentum right now for these issues. We as people, as community have to demand it of our lawmakers, right? Um, they, the, the current powers that be would love to get away without tackling these issues. They would love to be able to cut these critical services to our communities, to keep giving corporate giveaways to their biggest donors uh, and maintain the status quo, right? And so that is part of the the challenge we face this session, and uh, but it's one that I know we're going to rise to. And I, I want to give a shout out to folks at SEIU, FPSU, who are currently working on launching the People's Budget Campaign to really emphasize um, these uh, these inequities in our tax system and put it in a way that we can sort of communicate with so many folks around these inequities and demand that we pass combined reporting, as you said, uh, JJR, and, and and really center people first. Uh, over corporations and special interest uh, this session. So I wanna see uh, if we have any more questions from the audience. I know our time is running short before we sign um, off. But can I briefly we'll, add something? Yeah, actually, I think what we'll do, cause we have just a few minutes, maybe we'll do closing remarks from both of you. And I, I have a few last things I'll note as well. Yeah. So let's do that since we have about just seven minutes. Um, so Dr. Santos, would you like to start? I'll just mention something that came up during the conversation and we keep saying our system and it is a structural issue. And I think, uh, Senator Rodriguez will have, I think he has a law degree, so he'll have more of a say than I do in this, but it is structural in the term, in, if we look at the Florida Constitution, it does dictate, for example, we were just talking at the local level, it does dictate what local governments can and cannot do. In fact, in, they're very limited in how they can actually collect revenue. It's just property taxes. I think that was mentioned. If they have any other available, like a local sales tax, that's because they've been allowed to do that. So in terms of fiscal autonomy, it's all directed by the state. So that's something to consider. The other aspect of this is why it's so difficult is because in 2018, we passed a supermajority amend, um, amendment that basically states that if you want to increase taxes or change your tax code, you're going to have to get a majority, I think uh, two thirds, right? Or you have to check me on this one. But yeah, you have to get a majority in the House and Senate to pass this. So it's not as simple. Um, it's not as it's not as simple as just getting something done. We're going to have to really advocate and fight for these changes. So it's in every sense of the word, it is a structural issue uh, and a systematic issue that we should be, that we are fighting against. So I just wanted to add that. Uh, I appreciate that, Dr. Santos. And to your point, yes, we did raise that, that, that constitutional amendment made it even harder to pass any sort of new tax um, in Florida. Uh, and I, I'm also not a lawyer, but I have had some lawyers look at combined reporting, for example, and really argue that's more of a, a structural piece because uh, it's closing loopholes. And there's currently a debate around the online sales tax piece. And is that a new tax or not? And of course, the folks who are working to pass it. And, and I think I think not being a lawyer, but I think it's a fair argument to say it is a structural change as well. Um, and another really important structural change is just around that transparency piece so that we at least know what businesses are getting how much in these different tax structures in Florida. Because right now, again, a lot of those giveaways are 
are completely lack transparency. And so we don't know what companies are receiving these dollars as well. Um, but but so appreciate that insight as well. Um, before we sign off, uh, Jose Javier Rodriguez, the the, the iconic uh, senator that we all adore. Do you have any any final thoughts for us today? Um, I, I if you call me iconic, what I'm, I'm I'm supposed to say something great, but that's not going to happen. No, I think that the you know I, I just go back to the 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 point that that I raised at the very beginning, which is that um, you know everybody watching um, has been deeply impacted by this economic crisis um, has you know lives in a community that's been impacted by how unfair this tax system is and is directly impacted by how unfair our tax system is here in the state of Florida and I think that for a number of reasons it just doesn't get as much attention as it should and I think that it I think that we really need to um, you know, do everything we can to highlight this and to, to have this be part of our agenda. I mean, you mentioned FPSU, um, S, you know, SCIU, other, others in labor and so many community groups, obviously Catalyst, who's centering this as an issue because it really has a huge impact on our ability to do everything else that we really want to do. And, um, you know, combined reporting, a number of other things like that aren't raising taxes. All they're doing is taking our existing system and changing definitions, right? So that things are more fair. Um, and, you know, uh, th this earned income tax uh, uh, um, rebate piggyback, we called it, the, I think we called it the, the working families tax rebate or something. I mean, th that's not raising taxes, right? Um, so there's so many ways where we can try and tackle the regressivity in, in our tax system. And it's not just because of fairness, it's because, you know, it will improve people's lives in our communities. Um, and that's an important thing. So thanks for everybody who, like you said, took their happy hour to talk about taxes. It's really an amazing group we have here. <laughs> it really, it is. But necessary. And, you know, I think for all of us, our, our goal is to make it that economic prosperity for the state is not just about corporate profits, that it includes the prosperity of everyday people uh, and that, you know, together we all can thrive with tax fairness and making sure we're putting money back to people's pockets. And I'm actually, I don't read often, but I'm actually currently reading uh, Governor Ruben Askey's biography. And he, of course, is the governor that created the corporate income tax in Florida. He ran uh, his campaign on that in 1968, I want to say. And uh, in his inauguration speech, he gave a great quote. He said, the day has passed when the poor person, the little person's voice is not going to be heard in Tallahassee. Uh, and I know that is uh, something that we all really, truly believe in. It's why we do this work. It's why we, we've got blood, sweat and tears fighting for folks um, in the Capitol throughout our lives and, and in all the different facets. And I know it's critical to Catalyst Miami's mission. I love the work that uh, Catalyst does around uh, helping folks with their taxes and making sure folks understand that. And for me, I don't I don't know the first thing about how to do my taxes. Every, every year, I'm always a little worried I'm doing something wrong. It's a complicated process and it's it was made to, uh, to weigh the, the interests of the elite at the expense of everyday people. And so it's, it's up to us to change that. Um, and so I wanna, I wanna thank folks for joining us tonight. I wanna thank Dr. Santis and JJR for joining us this Friday evening. I hope everyone has wonderful, safe weekends. Uh, and with that, we will conclude this panel. And so thank you again, folks, for joining us tonight.